I have a question to start off today, and I'm wondering if Austin's tattoo maybe is an indication that we have some brave people here. I'm wondering if anyone has ever gone skydiving. Any skydivers? Oh, maybe? Okay, how about bungee jumping? Um, you know, okay, maybe not, maybe not. That's okay, me neither, me neither. I was just wondering, I was just wondering. Just thought I would ask. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't. But the closest thing I could say that I've done, and I'll admit only one time, it was very scary, is jumping off of a 10-meter diving board into a pool. And I remember being so surprised that I actually had time to think while I was falling. You know when you like jump off maybe just the edge of a pool or a short diving board, you're on the board, then you're in the pool. There's no in-between. But being in free fall for long enough to be aware of it was terrifying. Even though I knew logically that the pool was right there and of course buoyancy would do its job, it's kind of hard to trust and to be wait and to just be in free fall, there is no going back. Now, swimming pools, I'll say, are not really the sort of common pool that I intend to talk about. But I do think that a common pool can help us all be buoyant in a metaphorical kind of way. And to just continue with that swimming pool image for a moment, I also think that a common pool can be a radical place. Maybe some of you, like me, have been following the news over the past few years about descendants of the owners of an African-American beach resort in the LA area called Manhattan Beach. These descendants received reparations because their ancestors had been driven out by racism. It wasn't that long ago that people of different races swimming together at one beach or in one pool was largely unheard of. You may remember that in 1969, it was considered quite radical to have Mr. Rogers, a white man, put his feet into the same bucket of water as Francois Clemens, who was a black man playing a police officer on the show. It can be radical to share space, let alone to share possessions, let alone to do so across lines of difference. Now, returning to our scripture, I must say it is one of my favorites, not only for what it is, but for what it has inspired over time. Many Christian communities throughout history have experimented with various ways to live into its vision of what I'll call common pool living albeit to a greater or lesser extent with greater or lesser success. Perhaps you've heard of Latin American liberation theologies based communities or the Shaker movement. If you're not familiar with the Shakers, you probably are with their music at least. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. Of course, no perfect utopias, but I will say some faithful, earnest experimentation. A few years back, um, I participated in an art installation at Toronto City Hall. It was sort of a patchwork uh, quilt, and it was titled Restitching the Social Safety Net. It hung from the second floor atrium down to the ground level, and different patches on this quilt highlighted different social programs, and many of these patches were created by people who relied on those programs. The quilt was deliberately somewhat unraveled with some patches totally missing and the harsh Toronto winter light streaming through. One patch I remember said in shaky but clear script, Ontario Disability Support Program, not perfect, but enough to survive. Now we know that safety nets come in many forms and from many places. Families certainly, also other communities, unions, churches, states. Privilege can be a safety net. Faith can be a safety net, both in practical ways and in ways that are perhaps less tangible, but I would say no less real. 
I kind of think the stronger the safety net, the harder you can fall, but still bounce back. Kind of a, like a trampoline, maybe. The harder you jump down, the higher you can bounce back up. Now, weaker safety nets may still offer us some degree of bounce, unless they become so tattered they turn into nets that can entangle us, perhaps even leaving us worse off than when we started. Without a safety net, we may fall down completely, or we may be so fearful of falling, we don't take any risks at all. To me, it is quite powerful that the very first thing that the early church did was to establish a common pool. When Jesus left, his followers' very first act was to create a safety net of solidarity. I like to think of it a bit, a bit like building a system that would knit them all together into the new body of Christ. To become Christ for and with one another now that Jesus was gone. And this common pot would benefit not only them, but everyone and anyone who had need. I know it can be hard to trust and hard to let go. And sometimes we hold on for good reason. We know that systems can fail us, communities can fail us, even loved ones. Even people who have done everything right can slip through. Cults sometimes manipulate people and make them vulnerable by saying you can't have anything of your own. You can only have their so-called safety net. And because you can't survive without it, you can't leave. So there are good reasons to proceed with caution. But I also know that safety nets are powerful. I have felt that profoundly on many levels, on a maybe more emotional level. I know the more comfortable I am, the more willing I am to take risks. The more I feel known and loved by community, the more extravagantly perhaps I will joke and laugh and be my fullest, boldest self. I wonder if you have ever had an experience of feeling that boy, kind of void by friends or family or community. Perhaps supported practically or financially or maybe just deeply known, supported and affirmed. Where have, in your life have you felt free and able to take risks because you trusted that those around you had your back? And what did that feel like? Can you imagine a life where you felt that free most of the time? I read a study that found that people will perceive tasks as less difficult when they are doing them with friends. Like, people will guess that a strenuous hike will be less hard if they are doing so with others than if they are doing so alone. And the perception of our ability to do hard things increases the deeper the relationship. We are willing to try things, maybe like skydiving, um, when we do those with people that we love and trust. There's a woman who, after a great deal of serious illness, became a professional bike pack racer. This is someone who races for weeks or even months with everything that they need, tent, food on their bike. And this woman actually was disqualified in her race because her partner came to cheer her on too many points on the ride. It was deemed that this emotional boost gave her an unfair advantage. And actually, studies do suggest the impact of having someone cheer us on is real and measurable. There are also studies that find that people who have their basic needs met are more likely to be creative. We know that people who are more secure or are more likely to start new ventures, one of the best predictors of entrepreneurial success being family support, financial and otherwise. But just because that has been how it has been doesn't mean that's the only way it could be. I once read a book that was called Adventures in Simple Living. This was the first time I really started to think about giving up possessions as something that could be life-giving and fun and even lead to a more interesting life. It doesn't have to be just a selfless giving up, but it could be a gift to oneself too. 
I became, um, as perhaps some of you as well, active in my local buy nothing group during the pandemic. And I have to say, I love going on walks to pick up or deliver items that my neighbors and I give to one another. It's fun to end up wearing things I might not otherwise, or to think of my muffin tins going on a little journey, little adventure all on their own to be used to bake my neighbor's daughter's two-year-old birthday party cupcakes. Even though it is often perhaps easier to just throw things away or to order exactly what I want brand new, I think by nothing makes life an adventure in simpler living. I like also walking down streets. I might not go for the pickups. I hope this doesn't sound too strange to say, but I love the glimpse into other people's homes and other people's lives. But I also know that this is just a small glimpse towards a much broader vision, that deeper vision in the Acts story. It's so small to be almost trivial. I know that many of my neighbors are relatively privileged, and a lot of what we share are not essentials but extras. I know that as a white woman, I can walk up to a stranger's house, even sometimes accidentally the wrong stranger's house, and be likely given the benefit of the doubt in ways that others might not. I truly appreciate and think it's beautiful how the CCSM blessing box is a manifestation of today's scripture, and it really does target and benefit those in greatest need. What an expression of faith to have a literal common pool on our church campus where anyone can tr contribute food and anyone can take it. To me, it is a beautiful foretaste of that vision where all offer what they have so that no one is in need, no strings attached. And to me, it just seems so fitting that it's right by the door to our church so that bringing in and receiving food is integrated as an act of worship. Sharing food and worshiping God is one and the same. When I was preparing to preach today, I found in a commentary by African-American biblical scholar Mitzi Smith that the Greek verb proskartero, which is used to describe the mutual support that we heard about in the Acts story, is the exact same verb that is used to describe the disciples' attachment to one another as they gathered in the upper room with Jesus one last time. When the disciples were in that time of turmoil and loss, Smith argues that pro scartero is used to describe both deep emotional bonds of care and deep sharing, perhaps instructing us that those can be connected. I was also struck by the reminder that in moments of turmoil, like those the disciples faced, perhaps when we are outside of our usual patterns, we share more. We know this happens in times of natural disaster, often in times of upheaval, what is left when so much has changed is a simple recognition of our common humanity, our common needs. Perhaps you too have been moved by the stories of people living in safety outside of Ukraine, returning back home, or those who have chosen to stay in order to support the basic needs of those who still struggle in that country. Another scholar, uh, Jerusha, Jerusha Neal, reminds us that in Greek, it is the same as in English, in that the word common can be used to both describe things that are held jointly, owned jointly, so held in common, and it also can mean thing common as in commonplace, everyday or ordinary. When we share communion, we often talk about ordinary common things like bread and wine becoming extraordinary as windows to God. I wonder too if, being, if whole, by holding things in common, owning them jointly, an uncommon act, they can also become ordinary things offering an extraordinary opening for God in our lives. In moments of need, we may be the most open to one another and to God. Like the line that I love in the Leonard Cohen song, Anthem, there is a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. When we show our vulnerability and our need, we receive and connect. When our hearts break, often we bond deeply with others because we can't just pretend to have it all together on our own. 
Brokenness and openness, open-hearted living can be both a precursor to building and strengthening safety nets, and safety nets can lead us to be more open. I really see it as a cycle, openness, strengthening community care, community care, fostering openness. The more we put in our common pool, the more we need community. The more we contribute to community, the richer and deeper our common pool. When we go swimming, we take off layers to enter those common waters. We take off the clothes that tell of our personality and our status. Sometimes we become almost unrecognizable in just our swimsuits. In immersion baptism traditions where people go all the way underwater, they symbolize their old individual separate life ending and they rise back up into a new life of Christian community. Now, in our tradition, we don't generally do this practice, and there are good arguments on that side too, in part because we don't want to emphasize too much that there is an old life that's ending, and we want to remember the goodness of life from the very beginning. But I think there's, there's wisdom both ways. I think that in our world today, we have some things that we, we could wash away and let go, and those include our isolation, our individualism, our loneliness, our fear. Even as we remain uniquely who we are, we can also enter into a deeper shared sense of responsibility for and with one another, become that body of Christ. And I don't think it has to be a one and done. Every day we can start over, we can try again. Every morning we are born anew into connection, each night, we can release all that holds us back. In swimming pools, you, I'm sure you know, we float better when we relax and let go. If we kick and flail and keep, try too hard to keep ourselves above water, we might drown. What might you be freed to do if you knew there was a firm net below to catch you no matter what? If you knew that you did not need to bear fear or sadness or disappointment alone. If you really, truly trusted that you could ask for anything you needed. I believe that what is really real and the truest true is that we are one body, one people, connected through ecosystems to all of creation. And for that, I give thanks, deep thanks to God. I give thanks for all the times I have bounced back, falling but buoyed by loved ones and love itself. Today, if you feel that you are perhaps falling or slipping through a crack, please know that we are here for you as a church, and we do care. But it's hard to support when others don't know. Sharing the cracks in your life might cause even more light and love to stream through than you could ever imagine. Sharing your need might strengthen the common pool for us all. And if you are doing all right today, please consider ways that you might strengthen safety nets in church and elsewhere. I believe that life is more creative and adventurous this way. Pro Scartero happens when we share our love, our needs, and our possessions. Maybe these acts of deep sharing amongst the disciples not only anticipated the coming of the Holy Spirit, but actually brought her forth to come. It's possible. A common pool is a radical place. To put our feet in the same water of someone who might be totally different from us, someone we may not even like that much, is truly remarkable. I think that experience of common pool living is just what God dreams for us to have perhaps not all of our wants, but all of our needs. For us to have creative, abundant, deeply entwined life together. For us to show the cracks in our lives and let, let the light and love flood in. We can be Christ for and with one another, and we receive Christ from one another when we do. We were not meant to bear our burdens alone. Christ with our neighbor's face, even with a stranger's arms, with our beloved's cheers along the race, and even perhaps with an enemy's hands, can bear burdens with us and for us, inviting us into the deep weave of the world, 
the great entwined ecosystem safety net of all creation. For this and so much more, thanks be to God. Amen.